I'm Frank Stritter. I'm a uh, U.S. Army veteran and a retired faculty member from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, I'm going to um, present one of the series of military history presentations that I've been working on for the last few years. Who's Unsung Heroes? This time, African Americans and the Buffalo Soldiers and Lieutenant Vernon J. Baker. I'd like to start this discussion by asking a question. How did the segregated Buffalo Soldiers receive their name? Got an answer? The two most prevalent theories originated during the Indian Wars of the late 19th centuries. The first one came from the Cheyenne Indians in 1867, who saw the African American soldiers black curly hair and thought it looked like the mane of wild buffaloes. The other came from the Comanches in 1871, who thought the African American soldiers fought fiercely, just like the buffalo when cornered. So you can pick your favorite one. Let's begin with a brief history of African Americans in the US Army. Shortly after the Civil War on 28 June 1866, an act of Congress authorized the creation of six US Army units that, quote, shall be composed of colored men, end quote. The act reorganized that army for post-Civil War assignments and stipulated that all officers of those units be white. The units were organized as two cavalry units, the 9th and 10th, and four infantry regiments, the 38th through the 41st. On 21 December, 1866, the War Department activated the six regiments and charged them with helping control Native Americans of the Plains in the Indian Wars, capturing cattle rustlers and thieves and protecting settlers, stagecoaches, wagon trains and railroad crews in the West. One of the officers during the Indian Wars was Lieutenant John J. Pershing, who later became commander of all American forces fighting in Europe during World War I. Segregated Buffalo soldier units continued to serve after the Buffalo Indian Wars ended in 1898. Spanish-American War in Cuba the 1898 to 1903 Philippine American War and the 1916 to 1917 Mexican Expedition. The Buffalo Soldier Regiments were among the first units to fight in the Spanish American War. Rational then, but laughable today, the War Department believed that African American soldiers were immune to tropical disease and not restrained by human temperature. Despite the sheer stupidity of the War Department and the racial tensions encountered at several stateside staging areas, Buffalo soldiers once again proved their mettle in Cuba. Their courage in assaulting fortified positions was highly praised by their white officers. One of the 10th Cavalry's officers in Cuba was once again John J. Pershing, whose nickname Blackjack reflected the, his advocacy of his African-American troops. Interestingly, but not surprisingly, publicity and recognition of the Buffalo Soldiers were overshadowed by the first volunteer cavalry, better known as the Rough Riders led by Teddy Roosevelt. The Buffalo Soldier units were largely disbanded at the beginning of World War I. The segregated 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions were then activated, the 92nd in October 1917 as the Buffalo Division, and given the Buffalo Head emblem as a tribute to their Buffalo Soldier Regiments. It was deployed to Europe during August 1918 and saw action primarily in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the last Allied operation of the war. The 92nd was deactivated at the end of the war. 
The 93rd Division was activated in December of 1917 and sent to France. However, its troops never fought together as one division. Over the objections of both of its division commander and General Pershing, it was broken up and brigaded with French units. A division shoulder patch with its blue French Adrian helmet commemorated its service with the French. During the Battle of Bellahu Wood in 1918, a panicked French general ordered his French soldiers and another famous African American unit, the Harlem Hellfighters, to retreat. Colonel William Hayward, the Hellfighters' white commanding officer, responded, Turn back? I should say not. My men never retire. They go forward or they die. The Hellfighters spent 191 days in frontline trenches, more than any other American unit. None were captured, and it was said that the Germans never gained one inch on ground against them. The 93rd was also deactivated at the war's end. White commanders with racial outlooks actively discouraged the use of African Americans in combat in World War II. Some 40,000 African Americans ended up as construction troops rather than serving with one of the two combat divisions. The 92nd was activated in October 1942 to fight in World War II and then spent almost two years training in the United States before being shipped overseas in June 1944 to fight in Italy as part of the U.S. Fifth Army. So even though there's prejudice against them fighting, they did, and they fought well. Vernon Baker was a member of the 92nd. He graduated from high school in Iowa and then worked as a railroad porter, a job he despised. He enlisted in the U.S. Army in mid-1941. At his first attempt to enlist, Baker was turned away by a recruiter who told him, we have quotas for you people. He tried again a few weeks later and was accepted by a different recruiter. Baker accepted this requested assignment to a quartermaster unit that was instead sent to the infantry. In 1942, he was encouraged to apply for officer candidate school by his uh, a commanding officer. After completing it in early 1943, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant and assigned to the 370th Regiment of the 92nd Infantry or Buffalo Division. Baker was the only African American officer in his company. On 1 August 1944, Baker's regiment landed in Naples. Italy as part of the Fifth Army in fighting its way north to penetrate the Gothic Line, the last major German defense line that stretched across central Italy. And when you look at this map, you can see that this white red line across here is, called, is the Gothic Line. The two red units, 14th and 10th, on the north side of the um, line were the German divisions. The eighth over here just south uh, was a uh, British division, and the fifth on this side of the on the uh, this side of the, uh, of, the uh, of the aisle was the uh, American U.S. Fifth, and of which Baker was a member. Uh, Baker was a platoon leader of a weapons platoon. On 5 April 1945, it was Baker's C Company's turn to advance. The objective they were assigned was to take Castle Egenalfi, a German artillery post and stronghold high on a hill. Three previous attempts to capture the castle had failed. 70% of the men in Baker's platoon were replacements with no previous combat experience. Moving more rapidly than the rest of the company, Baker and about 25 men of his platoon reached the south side of a draw some 250 yards from the castle within two hours. In his reconnaissance for a suitable position to set up a machine gun, Baker observed two metal tubes that were part of an observation post pointing out of a slit at the edge of a hill. 
Crawling under the opening, he stuck his M1 rifle into the slit and emptied the clip, killing the post's two occupants. Moving further up the hill, Baker stumbled upon a well-camouflaged machine gun nest. He shot and killed both enemy gunners. The company commander joined Baker in time to take a, a German to see a German soldier appear from the draw and throw a hand grenade that failed to explode. Baker shot the fleeing soldier and then ran into the draw alone. There, he blew open the concealed entrance to another dugout with a grenade, shot one German soldier who emerged after the explosion, threw another grenade into the dugout and entered firing his submachine gun, killing three more of the enemy. By that point, the Germans had spotted the advancing American units and began a mortar attack that pinned Baker and his men down. American artillery responded, quieting the mortars, but the Germans soon launched another counterattack. Baker found his company commander hiding in a house near the foot of the castle as all the commotion and what that went on outside. After telling Baker to get his men together, the commander said that he would head back for reinforcements to assist in taking the castle and to cover his withdrawal. Baker thought that he would probably not see the company commander again, and that he, Baker, would have to lead the company in its advance. Baker thought at the time that the company commander was a white man who could easily depart the battle zone with honor when the odds were overwhelming. He, Baker, also realized that he was an African American and that he must stay and fight until the last man to retain any shred of dignity. Facing a German counterattack, Baker was left with only eight men and little ammunition. He made the difficult decision to withdraw, hoping to save some of the lives of his men. He recalled, my men wanted to stay, but I wanted to make sure that some of them stayed alive. He then covered the evacuation of his company to draw the enemy's fire by occupying an exposed position. Baker managed to destroy two German machine gun nests with grenades while covering the rest of his men as they scrambled to safety. 19 of Baker's men had been killed in the 12 hours of the attack. The following night, despite having been wounded twice, Baker was assigned by his regimental commander to lead a company of white troops on a night attack to an enemy minefield and up to the front doors of the castle to secure the castle objective. During that mission, Baker located the bodies of the 19 troops that he had lost the day before, a devastating experience for him. It was one of the first times in American history that an African-American soldier was placed in command of white troops, even though it was technically unofficial. This two-day action helped to breach the Gothic line and drive German forces out of Northern Italy. Baker was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross or DSC, the second highest decoration for his efforts in this attack on the castle. The 92nd served in the Italian campaign from 1944 to the war's end, suffering approximately 5,000 casualties. It returned to the U.S. after the war's end and was deactivated in November 1945. After the war, Baker remained in Europe with the Allied occupation forces until 1947. At that time, his rank was reduced to non-commissioned status because he did not have a college degree. In 1948, President Harry Truman issued an executive order eliminating racial segregation and discrimination in America's armed forces. The last of the all African-American units were disbanded during the early 1950s. So the 92nd and the 93rd Infantry Divisions no longer exist. Baker continued to serve in the Army and led the way again during the Korean era. He had been recommissioned, 
due to the need for officers at that time, but he was not sent to Korea. The desegregation policy of 1948 was finally addressed by the army in 1951, and Baker was assigned command of an all-white company of the 11th Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He liked being an officer, but he did not fare so well with the social life that went along with being a peacetime officer. Baker's rank was again reduced to non-commissioned status in 1953, once again based on not having a college degree. As a company first sergeant, he became discouraged with supervising the often drug-induced soldiers of the 1960s and decided he had had enough. He retired in 1968 as a master sergeant and was then promoted on the retired list back to first lieutenant, the highest rank he had held during World War II. The military awarded 433 medals of honor during World War II, but only to white males. Not one of the 1.2 million African-Americans who had served in the war was even considered for one. In 1993, the Army, responding to pressure from the Congressional Black Caucus, asked Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, to, quote, determine if there was racial disparity in the way Medal of Honor recipients were selected, unquote. The Shaw study concluded that race had indeed played a pivotal role in which the political climate and Army practices during the war guaranteed that no African-American soldier would receive the military's top award. It also concluded that 10 African-American men who had been awarded the DSC should have been considered for the Medal of Honor. The Army had previously awarded Baker the DSC. The Army reviewed the recommendations of the Shaw study and upgraded the awards of seven of the 10 who had previously received the DSC to the Medal of Honor, including First Lieutenant Vernon J. Baker. The military thereby tried to rectify, at least in some small part, the discrimination that African-American soldiers had experienced during their World War II service. Baker had retired in 1968 to Northern Idaho. Then one day he received a call telling him that he was to receive a Congressional Medal of Honor. At first he was astonished, then he was angry. When asked about how he felt about getting the honor 50 years late, Baker responded that he was angry because it was something that he believed should have been done a long time ago. He said, and I quote, if I was worthy of receiving the Medal of Honor in 1945, I should have received it then. But receiving the honor now means that every black soldier that fought in the Second World War has been vindicated. Every one. America has a conscience and it is finally clearing that conscience. Thank God. End of quote. President Clinton awarded the Medal of Honor to those seven African Americans on 13 January 1997. Unfortunately, Baker was the only one of the seven still living. He said that all he could think about during the award ceremony were the 19 members of his platoon that had not survived the attack on the castle that day back in 1945. Vernon Baker died in 2010 at the age of 90 and was buried in Arlington Cemetery. He had written in his autobiography, I wasn't sure why I was selected for the medal. I was just a soldier, a warrior. My country sent, my country sent me into battle and I did what I was asked to do for all I was worth. Thank you, Lieutenant Baker, for doing what was asked. You certainly did it well and you are an unsung hero. Thank you for listening in uh, uh, about the uh, Buffalo Soldiers and about Lieutenant Vernon J. Baker. I hope you'll join us again.